Well, good morning, everybody. It is a beautiful foggy day here in New York City. And I know it's been a while since I've done a morning brief, but um, we've had a rash of Islamic State attacks in the news lately. One in Egypt, one in Afghanistan, and uh, a couple in the Philippines. And uh, the, the attacks in the Philippines are the ones I want to focus on today. This is going to be a long video because I'm going to present three reports. Two of the recent rash of attacks and one about a plot that was uncovered that details the United States State Department's plan to oust duly elected President of the Philippines, Duterte. President Duterte is a well-supported president. His military loves him. His people loves him. He's considered a nationalist. He's a man of the people. But last year, when, when he went after the drug lords in a major way, the United States decided to withdraw their support by not selling them um, guns anymore. Weapons. I'm not going to say a whole lot more in the way of an introduction, but but I will say this: that uh, we're we're coming to a time in history that we've never been to before. We're about to be free, and so um, the Kazarian mob, if you want to call them that, is is throwing a hissy fit. The controllers, we'll, we'll we'll call them that. I don't like labels because that leaves some people out who need to be included, and it includes some people who need to be left out. But the controllers are losing a grip. They're doing whatever they can do to start a war or, or to maintain their hold, even though they know it's over. And so um, keep that in mind as, as you listen to these reports. And um, that'll be it for today, probably. And I will see you next time. I will not hesitate to do anything and everything to protect and preserve the Filipino nation. I might declare martial law throughout the country to protect the people. Martial law of Mr. Marcos was very good. USA Today from the Associated Press, May 24th, 2017. ISIS-linked militants attack Philippine city, behead police chief. Iligan City, Philippines. Islamic State group-linked militants swept through a southern Philippine city, beheading a police chief, burning buildings, seizing a Catholic priest, and his worshipers, and raising the black flag of IS, authorities said Wednesday. President Rodrigo Duterte, who had declared martial law across the southern third of the nation, warned he may expand it nationwide. At least 21 people have died in the fighting, officials said. As details of the attack in Marawi City emerged, Fears mounted that the largest Roman Catholic nation in Asia could be falling into a growing list of countries grappling with the spread of influence from the Islamic State group in Syria and Iraq. The violence erupted Tuesday after the army raided the hideout of Iznilan Hapalan, a commander of the Abu Sayyaf militant group who has pledged allegiance to IS. He's on Washington's list of most wanted terrorists with a $5 million reward for information leading to his capture. The militants called for reinforcements. Around 100 gunmen entered Marawi, a mostly Muslim city of 200,000 people, on the southern island of Mindanao, Defense Secretary Delphin Lorenzana said. We're in a state of emergency. Duterte said Wednesday after he cut short a trip to Moscow and flew back to Manila. I have a serious problem in Mandaneo, and the ISIS footprints are everywhere. He declared martial rule for 60 days 
in the entire Mindanao region, home to 22 million people, and vowed to be harsh. If I think you should die, you will die, he said. If you fight us, you will die. If there's open defiance, you will die. And if it means many people dying, so be it. But he said he would not allow abuses and that law-abiding citizens had nothing to fear. Duterte said a local police chief was stopped at a militant checkpoint and beheaded and added that he may declare martial law nationwide if he believes the group has taken a foothold. Marawi Bishop Edwin de la Pena said the militants forced their way into the Marawi Cathedral and seized a Catholic priest, ten worshippers, and three church workers. The priest, Father Cheeto, and the others had no role in the conflict, said Archbishop Socrates Villegas, president of the Catholic Bishops' Conference of the Philippines. He was not a combatant. He was not bearing arms. He was a threat to no one, Villegas said of Cheeto. His capture and that of his companions violates every norm of civilized conflict. Villegas said the gunmen are demanding the government recall its forces. Military spokesman Colonel Edgar Aravelo said 13 militants had been killed and that five soldiers had died and 31 others were wounded. Other officials said a security guard and two policemen were also killed, including the beheaded police chief. Aravelo said troops had cleared militants from a hospital, the city hall, and Mindanao State University. About 120 civilians were rescued from the hospital, the military said. Thousands of people have fled the city, said Mama Jo Henry, an emergency response official. She quoted another official as saying, Marawi was like a ghost town. Broadcaster ABS-CBN showed people crammed inside and on top of public vehicles leaving the area, and some walking on foot with their belongings as they passed through a security checkpoint manned by soldiers. Martial law allows Duterte to use the armed forces to carry out arrests, searches, and detentions more rapidly. He has repeatedly threatened to place the South, the scene of decades-long Muslim separatist uprisings, under martial law. But human rights groups have expressed fears that martial law powers could further embolden Duterte, whom they have accused of allowing extrajudicial killings of thousands of people in his crackdown on illegal drugs. Hapalon, an Arabic-speaking Islamic preacher known for his expertise in commando assaults, pledged allegiance to the Islamic State group in 2014. He is the commander of the Abu Sayyaf militant group and was wounded by a military airstrike in January. Troops sealed off major entry and exit points to prevent Hapalon from escaping, military, military chief of staff general Eduardo Ano told the Associated Press late Tuesday. We will conduct house-to-house clearing and do everything to remove the threat there. We can do that easily, Ano said but added it would be more difficult in an urban setting because of the need to avoid civilian casualties. He said the group erected Islamic State flags at several locations. Provincial Vice Governor Mamantal Adyong said late Wednesday that more troops had arrived in the city, which was dark because 80% was without electrical power. Hopefully, The military will be able to control the situation in Marawi City by tomorrow, he said. Duterte met late Tuesday with Russian President Vladimir Putin and said he's counting on Russia to supply weapons for the Philippines to fight terrorism. Of course, our country needs modern weapons. We had orders in the United States, but now the situation there is not very smooth. And in order to fight the Islamic State, with their units and factions. We need modern weapons, he said, according to Russian state news agency TASS. 
while pursuing peace talks with two large Muslim rebel groups in the south, Duterte has ordered the military to destroy smaller extremist groups, which have tried to align with the Islamic State group. At least one of those smaller groups, the Maat, was involved in the Marawi siege. It's one of the less than a dozen new armed Muslim groups that have pledged allegiance to the Islamic State and formed a loose alliance with the Hapalon reportedly designated as the alliance's leader. Political analyst Ramon Casiple said the Maat is a clan-based group with members in Marawi, who came to Hap- Hapnilan's assistance, with some directly assisting in the fighting and others fanning out to different parts of the city, setting up checkpoints and burning some buildings and taking hostages from the cathedral. It is difficult to root out because they are from there, he said. The moths are embedded in the population. The group has been blamed for a bombing that killed 15 people in the southern Deveo City, Duterte's hometown, last September, and a number of attacks on government forces in Laneo, although it has faced setbacks from a series of military offenses. Last month, troops backed by airstrikes killed dozens of Mott militants and captured their jungle camp near Laneo del Sur's Piagapo town. Troops found homemade bombs, grenades, combat uniforms, and passports of suspected Indonesian militants in the camp, the military said. From Reuters World News, Sunday, May 28, 2017. Bodies of civilians dumped near Philippine City besieged by Islamists by Tom Allard, from Mawawi City, Philippines. Bodies of what appeared to be executed civilians were found in a ravine outside a besieged Philippine city on Sunday as a six-day occupation by Islamist rebels fending off a military onslaught took a more sinister turn. The eight dead, most of them shot in the head and some with hands tied behind their backs, were laborers who were stopped by Islamic State-linked militants on the outskirts of Mawawi City while trying to flee clashes, according to police. Nine spent bullet casings were found on a blood-stained patch of the road at the top of the ravine. Attached to one of the bodies was a sign that said, Monafique, or traitor. The discovery confirms days of speculation that Mott rebels had killed civilians during a takeover of Marawi, that the military believes is aimed at winning the Mott recognition from the Islamic State as a Southeast Asian affiliate. The fierce resistance of the Mott gunmen and the apparent executions of civilians will add to the growing fears that subscribers to Islamic State's radical ideology are determined to establish a presence in the southern Philippines with the support of extremists from Indonesia and Malaysia. The Army deployed more ground troops over the weekend and dispatched Army and Air Force helicopters to carry out rocket strikes on Mott positions as fighters held buildings and a bridge deep inside the predominantly Muslim city where few civilians remained. Some of those trapped in Marawi had called and text-messaged a hotline pleading with the military to stop the airstrikes, according to Zio Alanto Adyong, a local politician coordinating complex efforts to evacuate civilians, dead and alive. Some have no food at all. Some fear for their lives, he told Reuters. This is a conflict that has gone beyond proportion the magnitude of the degree of the damage and the people that are affected is really massive. At least 61 militants were killed and 15 security forces as of Saturday, according to the Army, which said it could confirm nine civilians killed by militants. At the ravine where the bodies were found, Marawi police officer Jamail C. Manadang said the victims were carpenters who were part of an evacuation convoy stopped by rebels late on Saturday. 
Recalling information provided by their manager, Manganang said the victims were pulled off a truck because they were unable to cite verses of the Quran, the Islamic holy text. Brazen siege. The military said it was possible there were other victims. This development validates a series of reports of atrocities committed by the militants earlier, said military spokesman Restituto Padilla. We are still validating other reports of atrocities. Islamic State's Amak News Agency last week claimed responsibility for the Mott's brazen siege. Unverified statements claiming to be from the extremists have appeared online declaring the city of 200,000 people the Islamic city of Marawi. President Rodrigo Duterte on Sunday canceled a trip to Japan to address the unrest in Mandanao, an island of 22 million people where martial law has been declared. Police on Sunday outlawed guns there and suspended all weapons permits. Fierce battles took place on Sunday as ground troops engaged Mott fighters with heavy gunfire and artillery. Plumes of smoke were seen on the horizon, and helicopters unloaded rockets on rebel positions. A surveillance drone circled the sky above Marawi. Some civilians tied white cloths to poles to distinguish themselves from militants as soldiers on foot huddled behind armored vehicles that crawled along deserted streets. Tens of thousands of people have fled Marawi since Tuesday when militants went on the rampage seizing a school, a hospital, and a cathedral where Christians were taken hostage, according to church leaders. Scores of prisoners, among them militants, were freed when the rebels took over two detention facilities. The violence erupted in response to a failed attempt by security forces to capture Isnalan Hapalan, who the government believes is Islamic State's point man in the Philippines. The military is certain the Mata protecting Hapalan and had narrowed down his location. Hapalan leads a radical faction of another Mandaneo-based group, the Abu Sayyaf. The little-known Mott group has staged several days-long sieges in Mandaneo Island, but none on the scale of Marawi, where witnesses said flags resembling those of Islamic State had been flown and some gunmen wore black headbands. The Mott group was blamed for last year's bombing in the president's home city, Deveo, which killed 14 people, and its battlefield cap capability has been a serious challenge to a military that has far larger numbers and firepower. Another concern from, for the government was the discovery of Indonesian and Malaysian fighters with the Mott, which it said showed a domestic rebellion had expanded to become a far greater threat, driven by radical ideology. Reporting by Tom Allard. Additional reporting by Eric De Castro in Marawi and Manuel Mogado in Manila. Writing by Martin Petty. Editing by Michael Perry. Covert Geopolitics. December 29th, 2016. U.S. State Department blueprint to oust Duterte leaked by a U.S. Embassy insider. An elaborate blueprint to dislodge the Philippine president, Mayor Rodrigo Duterte, has emerged through a local newspaper in the Philippines. The oust Duterte blueprint was allegedly written by the former U.S. Ambassador Philip Goldberg, who started the verbal tussle with the then-candidate Duterte when the former issued an unsolicited statement detrimental to the candidacy a few months ago of the incumbent president. If you want to understand how exactly the U.S. State Department is conducting its regime change program without the use of ground military invasion against a targeted state, just read on. The Manila Times reports, not only did former 
United States Ambassador Philip Goldberg leave the Philippines with a legacy of fractured relations between the two countries, he allegedly left behind a blueprint to undermine Duterte. A strategic recommendation ostensibly to the State Department for the ultimate removal of President Rodrigo Roa Duterte from office, according to a highly placed source. It is not clear, however, if the State Department in Washington, D.C. had given its imprimatur to the recommendation by its former ambassador to the Philippines. A document received over the weekend by the Manila Times from that source said Goldberg had outlined a list of strategies to undermine President Duterte and called for his eventual ouster. The blueprint gave a timeline of one and a half years. Quoting Goldberg, it said the political actors, the opposition, would need all the political weapons in their arsenal to replace the Duterte administration and replace it with something more to the opposition's liking. He noted, however, that deposing Duterte would be a challenge for the opposition. Analyzing the president's weakness, Goldberg said that Mr. Duterte has no real friends outside his region for his propensity to mock and ridicule people close to him. He also said that the president's views are shaped not by ideology or personal ambitions, but by old-fashioned nationalism, where he holds the United States accountable for the Philippines' current state of poverty and dependency. To bring down Duterte, the Goldberg plan calls for stoking public dissatisfaction with the president over unfulfilled election promises, isolating the Philippines from the rest of the ASEAN by extending military assistance to member countries, except the Philippines and or through economic blackmail that aims to limit trade by some ASEAN member countries with the Philippines. Goldberg also encourages support for the opposition through aids and grants, sowing discontent among the Duterte supporters and cultivating the cleavage between the congressmen and the senators over the charter change issue. In brief, the plan calls on the U.S. government to employ a combination of socio-economic political diplomatic moves against Duterte to bring him to his knees and eventually remove him from office. The paper outlined the ambassador's strategies to be employed, such as political and economic isolation of the Philippines in the region by engaging the leaders of Japan, Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos, by highlighting the basic question of the risk of doing business in the Philippines. Enhanced U.S. military relationship with members of the ASEAN community except the Philippines. Blackmail neighboring countries so they would turn against Duterte by reducing trade with the Philippines in favor of Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. Deepen ties with Philippine officials, the opposition, the police, military, and leaders in the region who share the U.S. concern over Duterte. Track corruption cases and highlight the failures of Duterte. Focus on the needs of the people at the grassroots and assist the opposition groups in delivering those failed promises through USAID, such as alleviation of poverty, housing, and education, to name a few. Utilize the media to expose the truth about Duterte, his false vision for the Filipino people, and his dangerous international relationships with China and Russia. Goldberg also recommends change the political landscape by dividing the core leadership of Duterte by sowing discontent among his party mates. He observed that some of the president's allies are privately becoming concerned over his shift in foreign policy and the twist in the character of his economic and social agenda that veers closely toward the left. The former U.S. ambassador underscores the need to stoke the fire between the defenders of the rule of law and Duterte's leftist group by highlighting the demands of the left to free all political prisoners in the country even before a formal peace agreement could be signed between the government 
and the CPP, NDF, NPA, and an end to U.S. military presence in the Philippines. It is not clear from what the source said how Goldberg would go about the weaken go about weakening the Philippine currency, but it states that such a scenario would lead to inflation and would raise uh, prices of food and other commodities. Authors note he was wrong though in predicting that a weak peso would make our agriculture less competitive. On the contrary, a weak peso would help strengthen our exports and make our products more competitive in the global market. The paper also quoted Goldberg's recommendation to capitalize on a possible stalemate as a possible course of action if and when the lower house marginalizes the Senate on the voting of charter change. The lower house has already publicly declared that both the House and Senate should vote as one and not separately, as espoused by the senators. Voting as one, as some senators say, disenfranchised them, given the sheer number of the congressmen, 240 representatives versus 24 senators. There will be a fallout as a result of the charter change stalemate. Many legislators will break away from the administration as a consequence, Goldberg predicts. In his observation, the U.S. former envoy to the Philippines said that while President Duterte has been successful in earning the support of the people for his campaign against drugs, his political and economic program has failed to deliver the desired results. The U.S. government, he said, should try to understand how Duterte thinks and what his next moves would be. With growing concern about the country's security situation and economic discontent, the pressure is on Duterte to deliver concrete results, the paper wrote, quoting Goldberg. In this increasingly sensitive environment, a country susceptible to favor political disruption, our approach must be measured. Opposition actors across the political spectrum look at us, U.S., for cues and our, U.S., influence is much greater than our footprint. Goldberg also advises restraint in expressing public support for former President Fidel Valdez Ramos and Vice President Lenny Robredo, as well as other opposition leaders, so as not to alarm the Duterte administration of an impending destabilization or a coup. He admits, however, that the operation coup is obscured with difficulties. Two other options were presented by Goldberg, according to the paper. The rift among the Duterte supporters should be exploited or assist the Robredo-led opposition groups to include the Catholic Church and other religious groups, business sectors, civil society groups, and the youth in addressing the international community regarding the shift in foreign policy issue, restoration of democracy, and the protection of human rights through constitutional means. Goldberg predicts a worsening of the U.S.-Philippines relations, more so on the issue of the U.S. military presence in the Philippines, more particularly during the last two years of the Duterte administration. The paper also wrote that the former U.S. ambassador to the Philippines wanted to know the views of Senator Bongbong Marcos on a variety of issues such as the Enhanced Defense Cooperation Agreement, or EDCA, China, human rights, and the U.S.-PH relations. Now you understand how the United States has been scheming the political and economic affairs of the Philippine citizenry for the last 113 years. So, who exactly leaked Goldberg's anti-Duterte plot to the mainstream media? Congressional hearing regarding State Department oust Duterte covert ops. There will be a congressional investigation soon, but allow this writer to disabuse your mind for a moment, and let's explore as to who could be behind the leaking of the Goldberg oust Duterte plan. First, we already know that the leak came directly from the highly placed source inside the U.S. Embassy in Manila, 
but we cannot expect that the people there would volunteer the information to the Philippine Congress. Yet there are only a few specific highly placed personalities who should have access to the Aust Duterte blueprint left behind by the former American ambassador to the Philippines, Philip Goldberg. In fact, we can only think of one potential silent whistleblower as of now, and he is of Asian blood. He was directly in front of the president when the latter expressed his candid assessment of the true root cause of the moral rebellion in southern Philippines, justifying his preference for a shift to a federal parliamentary system of government. The United States were here. They lorded it over for 50 years and lived off with the fat of the land. But when they want out, they want out and it was still a unitary type of government, and to hear them say, we will cut off your aid if this thing happens again. Come on, shut up. Shut up. I do not need your assistance. Millennium Challenge? $400 million? China is going to release to me $15 billion. Go home. I do not need you here. Duterte further advised the West that you should be careful with Orientals. With due respect to the ambassador of the United States, when you're dealing with Asians, be very careful of your language. You could not do that to the Japanese or Koreans. They'd feel insulted. Why do you have to say, we'll cut off your aid if? He said these statements point blank to the current ambassador of the United States to the Philippines, Sung Kim, who was sitting directly in front of the presidential podium at the inauguration of the Entrepreneurship for Peace in Sulu, the first collaboration between the Duterte government and the local business community, i.e. progressive sector of the oligarchy. Would it be too far-fetched to speculate that the newly arrived ambassador, who happens to be Korean, was the one who leaked the Goldberg blueprint to preempt the Kazarian plot to oust Duterte? Surely, the ambassador is already making himself available to the children in the country. Yes, it's all, pu it's all public relations BS, but it's already a huge departure from his predecessor, who prefers to spend his time spewing garbage through the pro-U.S. local media, commenting on what a president is doing to better the lives of his people is a big no-no in any foreign diplomacy. Other ambassadors are not doing what he's doing, and quite frankly, he should be slapped with a persona non grata badge on his way out. He should have tucked his tongue to the bilateral relations only between his country and the host, and not comment on any business involving a third party, unless the former ambassador was sowing intrigue between the people and the president, which is, of course, what is now being revealed, outlined in the leaked blueprint that he allegedly wrote to begin with. Why would the U.S. State Department and the CIA want to remove Duterte from office? The primordial reason why would they want to remove Duterte are his decisive pivot to China and Russia and his highly effective war on drugs. The first measure is dealt a destructive blow to the Clinton-Obama Pivot to Asia doctrine to mitigate the growing influence of China in the region. The second one dented the CIA drug sales in the country in a big way. Duterte's drug war banging on CIA drug enterprise in Southeast Asia. The Philippine authorities have proclaimed a victory over the war on illegal drugs as the largest drug bust ever in the history of Philippine drug busting involved PHP 6 billion worth of high-grade methamphetamine, led to the arrest of the most sophisticated drug manufacturers so far. Said group dismantles their equipment after every cooking session. Pre-raid NBI surveillance took about four months of hard work. Previous drug busting yielded this, the discovery of a 4.8-ton monthly capacity drug laboratory in Virac Cantanduanes, and hundreds more drug busting operations upon medium scale meth labs spread all throughout the country. 
in addition to the domestic efforts to squeeze the fancy world of the local drug lords, Duterte has been very active, according to the country's war on drugs, with the rest of the ASEAN members he had already visited to in the last six months. If the agency that is running the whole illegal drug enterprise is looking at these highly successful anti-drug operations, it will be forced to act just to save its milking cow. If the State Department, which sought to destroy the country from within, is looking at this same decisive effort to change the economic conditions of the Philippine population so that they would never be slaves in foreign lands, no more, it must seek to dislodge the authority of spearheading these actions. Duterte must be outed from his position now. If the State Department and the CIA should decide to pursue its ousting of President Duterte, as they've done in the past to several Philippine presidents, it would not succeed now that the full spectrum of Philippine society, i.e. class A, B, C, D, E, communist cadres and Muslim successionist groups in the South, are all with him in the march towards real and meaningful change for all. Conclusions Nationwide demonstrations spearheaded by the Catholic Church have so far netted only a few brainwashed students from the Catholic schools and state universities. Even a military coup is much harder to pull off due to the active engagement of the president as to their plight as the protector of Philippine sovereignty. Duterte is one of the few presidents, if not the only leader, who actively visits the military camps and military hospitals to let them know that a true government of the Filipino people is now in charge of Philippine affairs. No wonder that the presidential security guard made an effort lately to sing a few Christmas carols to their commander-in-chief. In its entire history, this is the first time that they ever did this voluntarily to a sitting president. Their loyalty to their oath and the republic at large has never been put to question in the past. We can rest assured they won't fail the president now and in the next six years of his term. It would become even more difficult for the Aus Duterte operators starting next year when his own national budget will be in full swing and multiple infrastructure projects are being implemented. The CIA's and U.S. State Department's only option would be a lone assassin, just like that was used against the Russian ambassador a few days ago. The Filipinos may have, a, have long ropes, but when they loose it, they can do the extremes, too, and they are everywhere. So, we can speculate with a high degree of certainty that if something will ever happen to the president during his term, a destructive effect on the close relationships between the two governments will surely develop in the aftermath of such an event. To those people seeking his ouster or his death, Duterte has this to say. Some people say that I should be very careful with the CIA, and I'd tell them, well, if it's my time, it's my time. But somebody has to stand up against them and say, you know, don't fuck with me. Don't fuck with me. Mayor Rodrigo Duterte, President of the Republic of the Philippines. <laughs>